This is KOOP HD1 HD3 Hornsby, radio for people, not for profit. Welcome to Volumes, the Austin Public Library radio show. Each week, we explore how your library is more than books. The library is knowledge, technology, and inspiration for our community. Hello and happy St. Valentine's Day to everyone. This is DJ Harris. Kanya Lyons couldn't be in today. She's a bit under the weather and all of us here wish her a quick and speedy recovery. Today we're going to hear stories from the writers at the Challenger Street newspaper. The Challenger Street newspaper is written by people who are homeless and in Austin and their allies. These stories do not represent necessarily represent the opinions of KOOP Radio or of the Austin Public Library. They represent only the opinions of the writers. So let's give a listen here on KOOP HD1 HD3 Hornsby. I'm Valerie Romnes, the director editor of the Challenger Street newspaper. We're 95% homeless written and I'm the editor who doesn't edit. I have the writers edit their own work so I don't change their voice. You can find out more about the Challenger newspaper at challengernewspaper.org and challengernewspaper at yahoo.com. I hope that you enjoy listening to our writers read their articles. Thanks for listening. My name is Christopher Carr. I'm a writer and distributor for the Challenger, and I'm reading um, from my poetry that's published in the, the last two issues of the Challenger. And since this is for a, a, a Valentine's Day edition of the, the uh, co-op radio show, I'm the, uh, one of the poems published in the, the February Challenger is a deliberate riff on this long-standing tradition of writing love poetry to uh, unrequited nymphs in the, in the forest or something like that. So Christopher Marlowe began this tradition about the time of Shakespeare writing a poem called the the passionate shepherd to his love. And then Sir Walter Raleigh cynically wrote a persona poem of the nymph reply to the shepherd, which is kind of a funny reply. And then in our own century, or the last century, uh, the actor Daniel Day-Lewis, his father was a, 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 a great poet of the 20th century named Cecil Day-Lewis. And he wrote a riff on that poem, which is more like a sort of 20th century uh, down, in the, down in the doldrums of urban poverty and, and work and whatnot. So it's an interesting take on that poem. So this is, a, this is my version of that poem having to do with being homeless. And there's a sort of an irony because it's not written to anyone because who would invite, uh, who would inspire someone, who would love someone enough to follow them down to the street? I don't know, but this is not written to anyone in particular, but it sounds exactly like the poem that was written to uh, someone and it's not really to anyone in particular. So this is called just passionate houselessness. And uh, I'm not sure if the music or the meter is even good, so I'm, I, if it sounds bad, I apologize in advance. Come live with me and be my love, and we shall all the pleasures prove that cardboard, cement, and the elements might yield on autumn dappled vents. Illegally we'll sit on every squalid curb where sleeping will cease to be a verb. In the heat, the rain, and the cold, we'll ask for change for a talent sold. I'll make thee a bed of charity blankets. I'll make thee a cap of costume argots. And CZ's the jeweler wouldn't buy, and this to accompany your maiden's eye. From charities consign your raiment's delight. I'll feed thee peanut butters in the night. In the morning, same breakfast three years straight to assuage your hunger fears. Your feet shorn through threadbare socks. I'll retread your soul that cold toes doth mock. And my love, unlike the acid and the housed, will have the sky with all its blue roused, will mock the sheltered fools from across the lot. Your jewels, why yes, how much? Two smokes and a light. Why thanks, they're real, be they yours aright. We'll hear the fellow muttering to himself, but for the grace of God ourselves, the grackles, the pigeons, and the speckled starlings all feather together in squawks and sings. Complacencies of my fuzz blanket and late coffee, the blue freedom met of a dolphin smiling, a hair serrat, mingled to dissipate the pneumatic sound of silence. This is not all I could go on, many things I haven't to mention, but if any of these things my mind may move, then live with me and be my love. 
a lot of what I'm doing and writing over the past six months has to do with uh, the fact that um, I'm constantly trying to maintain a, a library outside, and it's impossible to keep your maintain books of boxes of books through rainstorms and whatnot. So I decided to stop even trying to maintain books, and and when I started writing, I didn't have any books and I didn't have a phone, so I had to reconstruct all the poetry that I read from like 20 years ago, and I was just using that as sort of like a, a mental guide to, to write something. And that's where a lot of this poetry that I've been writing comes from, because it often focuses on a single poem written by a significant author. And the first one I'm going to read is, is deliberately based upon a poem by Donald Justice, and it's a, it has a kind of a sideways reference to a poem by him, but it's not exactly a congruent, but Anyone who's familiar with the poem will understand where this came from. So the poem, the poem is called The Words Injustice, which is a reference to his name. This is not the town of Ladora, beside the white interstates gray at night. Whomever had the light on, I did not drive past, where no one was. But I thought of maybe you, and these mysteries of belonging of who was here. A conflation of subwords, whose cigarette was this? Was it lit, and smoking before its end? Are they disgusted right now? This is not the town of Ladora. This one partitioned window. Whoever had the light on, nothing else blue black. Horizon, clouds, or mountains, I'll never know. How you are against the night, now, briefly cancelled, measured out, intransitive, mysterious, by the dull incandescent cartoon lion colors, like you light always ahead, outstripping me against the French and grey night, beside the white glowing drumlins falling like salt behind me. Cause the Bible tells me so, by Marcellus. God never said, let there be light. Three reasons why this is so. The word of God does not speak. It was physically impossible. The light was already on. There was no reason to say it. At that exact instant in time, whether it was for a picosecond or a trillion years, God did not exist. That is to say, the awareness of a God anyone's God did not physically exist. God does not denounce sexuality. LGBT is protected, not under the law, by the law, by the word of the law, by the words, so help me God, in the oath used to give testimony in the courtroom. God does not condemn abortion or same-sex marriage. God does not discriminate by race or gender. God does not speak. God provides the possible physical possibility of speech. The oath does not speak. Its provisions determine between fictitious and non-fictitious written documentation according to the oath. Everyone is equal between woman, man, and God. God does not judge. Law is determined by justice, same as the oath used to give testimony in the courtroom. The oath, the Bible, Word of God and justice all have the same source. They are the exact same. Each usage has a different name. Creation is the bringing of something into existence or physical awareness. Any acceptance of creation in the Bible establishes the acceptance of two facts. First, only three spoke. Woman and man, spoken word, and God unspoken word in the form of sunlight. Creation personified. Second, if any one of these three did not exist, there could not be a creation, no awareness, no life. We would not exist. To accept this fact, the unquestioned belief that sunlight and spoken word to be physically possible is to accept it must be carried on a wave. This was not a consideration in the Bible days. We have evolved. Language has evolved. Not to accept this as fact is the wisdom of a buffoon. Both waves must have a definite source. One wave is the creator of the other. Only one wave is the word of God. Only one wave is called justice. This is determined by the words of the oath. It is established by the words of the Bible and God said. 
If you are content with understanding the Bible in the same context as you would Harry Potter, that is your choice. I mean no disrespect to Harry Potter or its creator. It is what it is. It is fiction, nothing more. The product of imagination. The oath is pure logic, not supposition. This is established by the word and. The Bible is not based on fiction. Its origin is nonfiction, very much unlike a character. It and the oath are both based on scientific fact. Any belief in any God and the concept of justice is the unquestioned belief in evolution, even if unbeknownst. If you do not, you are the most ultimate atheist. A non-scientific posture is a disbelief in God, an insult to the Bible, a deliberate insult to justice, a deliberate position towards self-destruction. Sunlight makes no sound. It is physically carried on a wave. Spoken word makes a sound. All sound is carried by a wave. They are both carried by a wave. They are both called truth. Truth is anything that rides a wave. The wave that carries spoken word and unspoken word makes them physically possible. The wave is called whole truth. Whole truth makes truth physically possible. It must physically exist and simply establishes the requirement of a minimum of two attributes. Nothing is based solely on the one. Absence of any one, of any of the one, deprives physical existence. To be created, fire requires a triangle, heat, fuel, and oxygen. The removal of any one of them kills the fire. Nothing but the truth is the unquestioned acceptance of something as fact or ad- or document as proven fact that whole truth can physically exist. There was spoken word. To make any sound, we must first be alive. If you are dead, you could not. You are nothing but the truth as long as you are alive. What makes you live? Only one thing. This is explained by the oath. Not the sun itself, but what the sun does. The sun shines. This is not questioning. This is nothing but the truth. The shining produces a force in the form of a wave called whole truth. Whole truth brought the light, truth, or word of God. Whatever happened from the time the word of God in the form of simple light appeared until your acceptance of creation created you is your evolution. Sunlight, word of God, and justice are all blind. Word of God makes no sound. Word of God does not speak. Word of God is not questioned. Whatever Word of God did throughout evolution caused creation. We are the product of evolution or unspoken word. Sunlight, Word of God, spontaneously created us and everything in between. God did not speak. God had not been made aware of. God had no name. No one's God. The concept of God had not been created. Spoken word created the physical awareness of God. They justify each other. Creation depicted in the Bible is the acknowledgement of mutual respect, true equality. A triangle the same as the creation of fire. Without any one of the other, creation is impossible. Man woman, spoken word, God, unspoken word, are all equal. All equal according to the Bible, according to the oath, according to law enforcement. This is not questioned by the court or law enforcement, a spoken word. You're listening to Volumes, the Austin Public Library radio show on KOOP 91.7 FM and streaming at koop.org. Details about volumes can be found at library.austintexas.gov slash volumes. We're about to play a song by a song by Paul Simon called Homeless. And after the clip, you will hear you'll after that, you will hear some uh, upcoming events at the Austin Public Library. And then we'll be back with the second half of our 
Challenger Street newspaper stories here on KOOP HD1 HD3 Hornsby. Hey there, Austin. Teen program specialist Michael Harley from the Downtown Central Library here. Looking for something to read this week? The Austin Public Library hosts book clubs for teens across all of our branches. This week's book club will cover Lanny Taylor's award-winning novel, Daughter of Smoke and Bone, the story of Karu, a teen artist balancing a double life of real-world schooling and fantasy adventure. Teens can meet to chat with other fans of Daughter of Smoke and Bone at the Housen Branch on Tuesday, February 20th at 6.30 p.m. More details for these and additional programs can be found at library.austintexas.gov slash events. This is Ann Minner, Managing Librarian at the Old Quarry Branch. I get to highlight some information for children this week. Austin Public Library is excited to be offering our music and movement program for children ages 3 to 5 with their caregivers. Not only is it lots of fun for kids to stretch, sing, dance, and explore music with rhythm instruments, but music helps with early literacy by slowing down words and breaking them into syllables. This singing dancing program is sure to get everyone moving. This season, Music and Movement is being presented Thursdays at 11 a.m. at the Housen Branch, the second Monday of each month at 11 a.m. at the Pleasant Hill Branch, and the first Friday of each month at 11 a.m. at the Old Quarry Branch. This program is recommended for children aged 3 to 5 with their caregivers. Details about additional library programs for children are at library.austintexas.gov slash events. The Austin Toy Museum is a local nonprofit dedicated to preserving classic toys and educating people on their cultural significance. Part of our mission is to train special needs individuals through volunteer opportunities. You can visit us at 1108 East Cesar Chavez or check us out at austintoymuseum.org. You're listening to Volumes, the Austin Public Library radio show on Co-op 91.7 FM and KOOP.org. Radio for people, not for profit. Austin may boast it's the music capital of the world, but there isn't another city outside of Hollywood that loves the movies more. And that's why Lights Camera Austin takes a weekly look at what's happening in the world of film. We'll have interviews with homegrown and out-of-town talent, reviews of the latest releases, and an events guide that will keep you at the cinema seven nights a week. So don't be a slacker. Please join me, Robert Sims, from 2 to 3 p.m. Thursdays for Lights, Camera, Austin. Following the rules. Hello again, folks. Man, what's up with the police at our state capitol? Tuesday, August the 1st, me... The little woman and Bandit, our four-legged son, were at our spot hawking the Challenger. It was about 8.30 a.m. I was on the northbound Lamar side, and suddenly I heard yelling, Hey, get out of here! Get out of here! I turned around to look, and there were two male bicycle police officers stopped on the north side curb of Riverside Drive. As I stood there for a couple of seconds looking at them and wondering if they were talking to me, They apparently quickly became upset that I didn't just run since they had yelled to get out of here. They began crossing the intersection on the Riverside Drive side and coming towards me. They Uh rode right past a truck sitting in the intersection that was blocking the intersection and didn't even glance at him. They rode up to me like they were on a mission. What are you doing, they asked. Well, I'm selling the Challenger paper, I replied. Well, you can't be out there in the turning lane. You know there's a turning lane there. And I replied calmly that, yes, I know there's a turning lane and that I never step off the curb selling the paper because it's against the rules. Then, like as if I hadn't said a thing, they stated that I could cause a serious accident going back and forth out there. Again, I don't go off the curb because it's against our rules, I said. One officer, apparently disgruntled, got defensive and grumbled, yeah, well, what kind of rules do you got? So I began reciting the rules as they are printed on our rules of conduct sheet. And I finished with, I've got the rules and the laws right over there in my backpack if you want to see them. Both started repeating, no, that's all right, that's all right. It fell silent for a couple of seconds. Oh, why don't you all move up the street further, one officer asked me. And I came back stating, well, that's Fred's spot. Yeah, he's been there for a thousand years, one of them said. 
And I interpreted this answer as, one, they knew Fred, and two, they thought they had found a new face to flaunt some authority, when they actually found a person knowledgeable in police conducts and the law library. A few more subtleties were exchanged, and the patrolman said, Well, you have a good day, sir. I ended with, yes, sir. You guys be careful. Why is it that the people that follow the rules seemingly get confronted by the police, and the ones that are only motivated to ask for something free get left alone to do as they please? We, the homeless sector, must become aware of the laws that pertain to what we all do on a daily basis. Stand up for the rights we all have. We are living harder than the normal citizen thinks or could bear. And as most of you understand, we need to be present here and respected by the normality as fellow citizens that too comprehend and expect mankind's rights to speech, living, laws, and justice. A small handful cannot open a door that's stuck with the history of prejudice, judgment, and racism. It takes a majority vote to make things happen here in politics town. Man, can't we all just get along? This is a story written in 2012 about the establishment of safe sleep for women. This was in response to organizing by homeless people after the death of a homeless woman, Valerie Godoy. So as we unveil the opening of, of emergency shelter for women, it is important to remember that this crisis did not begin with Valerie Godoy's death. This crisis has long been on the lips of everyone who has been beaten in the street, who has slept in a parking garage on a cold night, or who has stayed in a poisonous relationship for shelter or safety. Over time, I've, I've been having two distinct conversations about the need for a women's shelter. With most house folks, the discussion has started with shock and surprise about the lack of emergency shelter for women in Austin, a city which has created an image for itself as progressive. With most homeless folks, especially homeless women, the lack has come up consistently, ever present, but almost old hat. It has come up in my conversations with homeless women since the very beginning of my voyage with the Challenger. I'm remembering the first, a conversation while flyering for the Challenger last March at a meal provided by Food Not Bombs in the now-closed Woldridge Park, not far from the dark corner of Duncan Park where Valerie Godoy was found murdered. At the height of organizing with the Ending Homelessness Working Group, I asked the question, whose movement is this, when we were advised by a longtime advocate to slow down? This question is still relevant today. Just as the crisis existed before Godoy's death, the movement of the homeless predates the recent shelter planning process. Recently, it has taken the form of Occupy, with 24-7ers making a home and a base for movement operations on the steps of our city hall, as well as a base for a few organizations, Occupy Austin, The Challenger, We the People, and the Ending Homelessness Working Group. The movement of the homeless also extends to the friends of Valerie Godoy, who planned the candlelight vigil in her honor and continue to participate in the planning process for the shelter. These movements are repressed at every turn by elites, from the clearance of the city hall encampment to the segregationist ordinances. We should also note the harassment of activists, arrests, notices to vacate street corners, and false charges against challenger writers and distributors. We should note the arrest of Valerie's grieving friend by the Austin police after they circled the candlelight vigil like vultures on bikes. We need to remember all the history of the last 10 months and to, re and to recognize that we won this shelter. Our voices and actions were the crisis that provoked the establishment of a new shelter. Safe sleeper. I am a safe sleeper at the Salvation Army, and it is not clean enough to keep other women from getting lice, bed bugs, and other diseases. They never clean the mats with pine saw or bleach cleaner or pure bleach. They never put them in the washing machines and wash them and dry them, and they don't clean them at all. Some of the employees are real rude to us. The bottom line is they just don't care about us women. They fix us crappy food and eat up all our donations and we never get any donations nothing but water and it's always hot never cold the two supervisors never leave their offices when we are there i am homeless and i have been staying at the salvation army for the last two years off and on 2015 was the first time that i stayed in safe sleep i met a man who was camping out in the woods i left the salvation army and went to camping with him the reason why I left was they did nothing to help me get housing like the Arch has been putting all of their homeless that really wants housing and places to live. I heard that they 
get funding like the Arch does to place people in housing. The Salvation Army has their favorite people that they like, but I am loud and I have a mental health problem. I get SSI and Social Security every month. My food stamps got cut to $15 because I was living at the Salvation Army. This year, they finally put me into the dorm and I was getting wrote up every day by other women. But I ended up leaving again because I got things stolen from me and the staff didn't do nothing about it. Plus, it is not a very clean place to live. The Salvation Army has big bottles of pine saw and big bottles of bleach and we can't use it. But the staff never use it. Plus, they take all the good food to their houses and feed the residents slop. But the the women and men who are in the workers dorm get fed better and treated better than the single men and women. This This, to me, is not right or fair treatment. Something needs to be done about these issues. These are the voices of our writers reading their own work. I hope you enjoyed our sampler of voices from John, Sketch, Anonymous, Peter, and Marsalis. And I want to thank Co-op Radio and The Pilot Show for this opportunity to use our voices. The articles are online at challengernewspaper.org. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Volumes, the Austin Public Library radio show. Special thanks to our producer, DJ Harris, and to the musicians who composed and performed our original theme song, Andrew Noble on violin, Kirk Duvall on guitar, and Mike Wheat on percussion. And thanks to you, our listeners. Volumes, the Austin Public Library radio show, airs Wednesday afternoons at 2.30 on Co-op 91.7 FM and koop.org. If you catch us mid-show, full episodes and other details can be found at library.austintexas.gov volumes.